got my notes right here. But. Okay. Well, good. Welcome to the uh, Lucas National Historic District. Scott Houston, uh, president of the organization, and uh, we're very excited tonight uh, for our lecture, uh, the 150th anniversary of the uh, Civil War. And uh, the Civil War was an important time at Lucan's. They had uh, gone from two furnaces to four furnaces and, and uh, had doubled their workforce from 17 to 34 or 35 people. Uh, and they uh, continued to turn out uh, during the Civil War. Uh, they for, forwent uh, their Quaker principles and started to turn out for the first time uh, products for the military. Uh, we have some quotes about them providing uh, steel for riverboats and gunboats. Um, but as well, Lucan's was known for providing boilerplate and of course, uh, locomotives being a large part of the Civil War, uh, you know, the burgeoning capacity of the railroad infrastructure and Lucan's, it's fascinating. Uh, tonight, we ha are very excited to tie that all in with Daniel uh, Toomey, who is a Civil War expert and, and has uh, presented uh, a research, which is uh, as well an exhibit down at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad uh, and a book, uh, The War uh, Came by Train. So uh, Daniel is uh, considered, uh, it's very, we're very pleased to have you here tonight. He's uh, considered a leading authority on the Civil War in Maryland, uh, graduate of the University of Maryland, and has co-authored uh, at least 10 books relating to the subject, including, I just have to read this, apologize, The Civil War in Maryland, uh, Baltimore during the Civil War, uh, The Maryland Line, uh, which is not too far from here, uh, of course, which is always interesting, uh, The Maryland Line, uh, uh, Confederate Soldiers' Home. Uh, and he has lectured and continues to do the circuit uh, as well on the war that came by train and, uh, and including uh, lecturing at Johns Hopkins and the Smithsonian, which is uh, impressive. Uh, also won awards on historical research and exhibits including uh, the Gettysburg uh, National Battlefield Award in 1985 and was a recipient of the Peterkin Award uh, by the National Park Service at Fort, Ma Fort McHenry in 2001. So um, we are very, oh, and you also played the cross, so very interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'll explain the punchline to that. <laughs> but again, please welcome Daniel as we go uh, and, and listen about the, uh, the war that came by train. Thank, thank you, Daniel. You, thank you very much. Uh, just to, to back up on that one, uh, I put in my bio at the bottom, my two fondest accomplishments are writing the inscription on the Maryland Monument at Gettysburg. People don't get to do that every day. And playing on the first ever Howard County lacrosse team back in 1964. I'm a wooden sticker. And uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased with that. And, and I'm, I'm very, very uh, pleased to be invited. I, I love going to places I've never been before. I'm sorry I didn't have more time to see your museum, but maybe I'll, I'll get back in the daylight and, and we can do that. In the way of... Uh, information out on the table. I put some books out, but I also put several free flyers, including our one on the War Came by Train. The War Came by Train is the largest Civil War railroad exhibit ever created, and it contains the largest collection of actual Civil War rolling stock in the world, including the only fully operational steam locomotive from the Civil War in the world, the William Mason. The William Mason uh, is, is operational. It will be out for steam days. It was in the movie The Wild Wild West, Gods and Generals, and all the way back to Disney's The Great Locomotive Chase. So it's a real movie star, and of course it's the icon of our, our collection. So we've got some free flyers for you, and I understand you're coming to see us, and, and that's great. Uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Uh, obviously the Civil War and railroading are gigantic topics, and you can't begin to tell everything you know even in a, in a single book. So what I'm going to do tonight, the, I'm going to flip through a few of these because this is a two-hour package and we don't want to do that. But uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to introduce you to the B&O Railroad. I'm going to introduce you to the situation um, that existed in the beginning of the war. And then I'm just going to talk about the first 90 days. And what I'm going to say to you, and hopefully I can defend my position, is that I believe that during the first 90 days of the war, now this isn't all the other things that went on, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was the first military and political objective of the war. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I'm, I'll get my buttons going here um, real quick. Now just a kind of few, few statistics, not going to bore you to death, but just to give you a feel for things. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was the first commercially operating railroad in the world. That, now people say, well, you know, we had this railroad here and England had that railroad there. Other railroads up until the birth of the B&O were basically conveyor belts. 
They were used to get ore out of a mine to a barge or lumber out of the hills to a ship. But they didn't carry people, mail, freight. They didn't have a schedule. The B&O had all that. Uh, altogether, it was in three operational units. It was the main line, which ran from Baltimore to the Ohio River at Wheeling, which is now West Virginia, was then Virginia. And that's why we're, we're called the B&O, the Baltimore, Ohio, because our charter said you go to, the, go to the Ohio River. And during the Civil War, that's as far as the railroad went. It, it didn't go through all the other states that it did at post-war. So that was about 380 miles. Then there was a, a branch to Parkersburg, West Virginia, at Grafton, and that was a little over 100 miles. And then there was the uh, Washington branch, which was very important. The Washington branch came off the main line and went 30 miles to Washington, D.C. What was critical about that, we'll talk about it a little bit, is that it was the only rail link, only direct rail service to the nation's capital until after the Civil War. And that's why our logo is the B&O with the nation's capital behind it, because we were the first railroad to service the capital. Now, in the annual report, President Garrett wrote for 1860, he said, our road has now attained a condition to challenge the comparison of any line in the country. Now, that was quite a statement. And uh, to give you an idea of its accomplishments, uh, by 1861, the B&O had 4,000 rail cars and uh, locomotives. It employed 6,500 people. And to give you an idea of its magnitude, there were 12 railroads in the state of Virginia at the same time. And of those 12 railroads, together they had 1,200 less cars than the B&O. So the B&O was, was, was quite a, and it was a profitable railroad, you know, so it was, it was quite something to behold. Now, this is a, a slide of Roseby's Rock, and, and it's a queer, it's an odd saying, track closed. What it means is it was completed in 1852. The railroad was completed from Baltimore to, uh, and it was founded in 1828. So it took 24 years to get from Baltimore to the Ohio River. And to do that, they had to accomplish a number of things. And uh, kind of an interesting scenario I'll use here today. Let's pretend that this is a business meeting and not a history meeting and we're gonna invest in a steel mill. And I said to you, we're gonna build a steel plant. And you'd say, well, we need furnaces and gantry cranes and loading docks and, a, and front office and all that. You'd know that, you'd put that together. Suppose I said to you, what's a steel mill? And I said, we're gonna build a steel mill. And you said, what's a steel mill? Well, that's what happened back in 1828 when they said, we're gonna build a railroad. People, what's a railroad? And in this time, before they got to that landmark, the Baltimore and Ohio, Ohio Railroad literally had to invent wheels, rails, couplers, locomotives, cars, even the terminology of railroading. And, and to penetrate the Allegheny Mountains, they had, to, they had to build bridges and tunnels that had never been built before. And I'll just give you one example of that. This is the Thomas Viaduct. It's uh, named, named after the first president of the B&O Railroad. It's absolutely beautiful. It's in Patapsico State Park. This bridge, construction began in um, 1832 and was completed in 1835. Now, a, it was built at that time, back in 1835, to handle locomotives the size of an SUV because they were just getting started, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. That bridge is 175 years old and it's been used every day since. It's double tracked. It's probably the only bridge in the entire Chessie system without a weight limitation. It survived all the wars, all the floods, all the hurricanes, and it's 175 years old and used every day. And I like to say the Romans couldn't have done any better. So, so and, they, and they did the same. There's tunnels out in western Maryland and West Virginia and, and bridge abutments that were built back then that are still used today. It's, so it's a magnificent accomplishment. Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture on Baltimore City, though I probably could. Uh, but um, uh, you can't talk about the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad with just, a, just a, a glimpse at the city itself. Baltimore, by the beginning of the Civil War, was the third largest city in the United States. It was second only to New York City and immigration. We had a tremendous uh, migration of Irish and Germans between the 1840s and the 1860s. And it was the largest industrial city in the South. And to put this into perspective, uh, the population in Baltimore in 1860 was 212,000. 
Richmond, Virginia, 150 miles south of us, us being us, not you guys, um, where the capital of the Confederacy would be during the Civil War, had 38,000 people. So you see the, the, great, the great disparity there. And Baltimore had everything. It had uh, factories making canned goods, clothing, uh, the Canton Iron Works. Largest rolling mill in the United States at this time was the Canton Iron Works. It was there that the plates for the monitor were rolled and then shipped up for installation. So, uh, you know, its, its capacity was endless. It had um, uh, uh, shipyards, which when the war came especially, they, they could build or repair warships. They had ships captains and, and, and trained crews. So it had all that. And uh, last but not least, it had railroads. Uh, there were four railroads that serviced Baltimore uh, at the time of the Civil War. I'm going to get in your... Oh, I can't do that. Okay. Uh, if you notice from Philadelphia, this isn't pretty clear, you come down to Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad comes in from the northeast. Uh, the northern central comes almost dead straight down from the north. Then if you look, you, you, you can't probably see relay just above Baltimore. Uh, that's another relay station. But there's a little Western Maryland Railroad that went out to Westminster. That was only about a 40-mile railroad at the time. It was in its infancy, but it would it would grow later into the to the Western Maryland. And of course, then we have the mighty B and O that comes out of the southeast side of Baltimore and goes all the way out to the Ohio River. And you see that uh, that dark line coming down here to Washington. That's the Washington Branch, 30 miles. And if you can burn into your memory bank that other line, that's the Annapolis and Elk Ridge Railroad, you see um, going to the state capitol, that'll, that'll strike the Annapolis and the b and at uh, a place called Annapolis Junction. We're going to talk about that. But so four railroads feed into the city. So that, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, let me uh, skip this story. Um, let's talk about Lincoln's election for just a little bit. This is kind of fascinating. President Lincoln... Uh, who, by the way, was probably the most famous, excuse me, was probably the most famous railroad lawyer in the country at the time. He had won a number of landmark decisions. Uh, Lincoln was the first president to use the railroad politically. And if you look here at Springfield, and he's going to be inaugurated, you see he could go Springfield, Cincinnati, uh, Columbus, Steubenville, come in Western Maryland and come down. He could have taken the... Yeah, here's a uh, pointer. Oh. The top button. Yeah, the red, uh, not showing up on the screen, I guess, maybe. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, anyway. Um, <laughs> he could have come in that way, but um, uh, he didn't. You see what he did? He, you have to understand, always the time you're talking about. You have to walk in the, in the shoes of the people then, not now. Or you lose the essence of history. Lincoln needed to communicate with the people in the North because they're the ones that elected him and he feared a war would be coming. So he made this incredible whistle stop journey, 12 days, 70 stops, uh, all through the North to introduce himself and explain his views on the Union to the people that had elected him. He comes down to Philadelphia and then he's supposed to come into Baltimore. Well, the, uh, excuse me while I get a drink here a second. Um, it so happened that the president of the Philadelphia Women's and Baltimore Railroad, uh, Mr. Felton and Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, uh, discovered a plot, and you know, real or not, but anyway, they convinced Lincoln that there was a plot to assassinate him when he came through Baltimore. Now, Lincoln couldn't really ignore such a thing, so what he agreed to do was keep his schedule in Philadelphia, go to Harrisburg, address the state legislature, but then instead of coming straight down into Baltimore, he'd go back to Philadelphia, uh, his car would be hooked onto the night train, and he'd pass through Baltimore at 3 o'clock in the morning and arrive in, uh, in Washington, and that's, that's what he did on, in February. He comes through uh, February 23rd, about 3 a.m., arrives at, this is him arriving at the uh, B&O station in Washington. Well, the next day, uh, Mary and the boys come down the regular route and they arrive on the scheduled train about 10 o'clock in the morning and there's thousands of people waiting to meet the president, most of which had not elected him, but at least they wanted to see the guy and he's not there. So they're not happy. And Lincoln really takes some political flack. Uh, 
Well, this is one of the more famous uh, political cartoons. It's, if you look, you can even see the Philadelphia Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad Company on the boxcar. Now, he wasn't in a boxcar, he was in a sleeper, but it's deriding his sliding through Baltimore in the middle of the night. And, of course, he takes a lot of heat. It's, it's not a good way to get started, and, of course, he and Maryland will have troubles. That's another lecture I could give just on Lincoln and Maryland, but I won't. Uh, but um, a friend of mine who's a Lincoln expert pointed out that, if you, if you recall, Lincoln and Mary Todd had quite a difficult marriage in the White House. You know, there's a lot of different issues. And he likes to point back to the time where Lincoln left her to the assassins <laughs> as a possible cause of all that trouble. Well, now, we'll get to my, uh, we'll talk about the Civil War in general just for a second. The Civil War has often been called the last Romantic War and the first modern war, and I buy into that 100%. And I would offer to you that there were two technologies, there were many, many technologies new for the Civil War. Uh, I have to stress the fact that I'm only talking about the two that I think are the most important. I gave this lecture once and, and the guy raised his hand and says, hey, you didn't mention balloons. Well, yes, they had balloons, but I doubt if balloons actually changed the course of history. But later on, of course, we had the Air Force. But the two that I'm talking about, and I think I can get you to believe, buy into, are the telegraph and the railroad. Now, at the, at the beginning of the Civil War, there were 50,000 miles of telegraph in the United States. That's pretty well established. And there were well over 300 railroads. I'm not sure exactly how many, but there were over 300, and there were 30,600 miles of track. Again, obviously, most of that was in the north. But the, the key issue with these two things is that uh, the telegraph and the railroad were well established. When the war began, they were ready to go. They didn't have to be invented. They didn't have to gear up. Uh, I was just watching on the History Channel of, uh, at lunchtime about the, the, home, the arsenal of democracy, the home front in, in the United States, and how Singer sewing machine starts making machine guns and Ford truck company starts making tanks. But that took time. The railroad and the telegraph were sitting there ready to go. And this is a Toomeyism, you can buy into it or not, but I would offer to you to combine the telegraph and the railroad conquered time and distance on the battlefield and changed the way battles and, and maneuvers would take place because of that. Well, moving ahead, um, <coughs> uh, that's a mistake, it's April 12th, I apologize. Um, just a timeline real quick to introduce you to things. April 12th, 1861, firing on Fort Sumter. Uh, April 15th, Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers to suppress the rebellion. So it's game on. On April 17th, Virginia secedes from the Union. Now the uniqueness of Maryland's geography comes into play. Maryland is a southern state. It's south of the Mason-Dixon line. It's the only southern state north of Washington, D.C. It completely surrounds the nation's capital. If Maryland secedes from the Union, and Maryland is a southern state, it is a slave state, Washington, D.C. will be located behind enemy lines. Not a good way to start a war for Mr. Lincoln. And you, again, you have to walk in the shoes of the people then. We know with 150 years of hindsight what happened. Lincoln didn't. Is he going to have to abandon Washington? Is this going to completely change the, the war as we end up knowing it? So all this is a big question mark. And the very next day, April 18th, five companies of Pennsylvania volunteers leave Harrisburg and come down on the Northern Central Railroad. Um, you, again, uh, you're going to see the, the Northern Central. So basically, I apologize for having this where it is, but this gives you an idea of the, nat the, the, the main line that goes all the way out, and then Grafton is the fork wheeling there and you see Washington down, but uh, you also see the state of Maryland, if you look at the state, all is all around Washington, D.C. Okay, so April 18th, five companies of Pennsylvania volunteers leave Harrisburg for Washington. They didn't come to attack Maryland, they didn't come to capture Baltimore, they're coming by train. They come in to Bolton Station on the Northern Central, they get off and they start to march to Mount Clare Station. Along the way, there's a spontaneous crowd erupts, uh, a mob action. There are pro-Southern people in the streets. They start throwing rocks and bottles. And Nick Biddle, a free black man, 
serving uh, as the as a servant for a captain in the uh, Washington Artillerist of Pottsville, PA, is one of the first men struck. Paving stone hits him in the head so badly that uh, uh, the the flesh is cut to the bone. He bleeds profusely. You have to drag him along with him. Another other men are injured, and uh, arguably you could say this was the first casualty of the war. I mean, whether you're struck with a rock, a bottle, a bullet, or a cannonball, you get hurt and you bleed. So uh, how ironic! The first casualty of the war, a free black man in Baltimore. Um, as the riot is, is developing, a detachment of Baltimore City police arrive. They quell the rioters. The soldiers march to the b &O station. They climb aboard a train of boxcars with wooden seats nailed in, and they go off. Now they have five, Lincoln has five companies of basically unarmed troops that he has to take care of, but at least he's got something. But the next day, history is made in a number of ways. On April 18th, the, uh, on, uh, the 6th Massachusetts Regiment under Colonel Jones will leave Phil, excuse me, on April 17th, April 17th, same day these guys leave Harrisburg, will leave Boston. <coughs> now, what's, what's special about these fellows, the 6th Massachusetts, uh, they are the first regiment that is fully armed, fully equipped, they even have a 16-piece band, and they answer the call. But for military history in terms of transportation, these 800 men will travel 450 miles over seven different railroads and arrive in Washington, D.C. in 48 hours. Now, that's changing the landscape of warfare. And I throw out to those of you familiar with the Revolutionary War and ask the question, how long did it take Washington's army to march from New York to Yorktown? Probably four or five weeks, not 48 hours. And they got there despite what's going to happen. Well, this shows them arriving at the Philadelphia, they're going to come down on the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. Now, this is the President Street Station. President Street Station is on the west side of the Inner Harbor. If you've been to Baltimore or you've seen the beauty shots watching an Oriole game or a Ravens game, uh, you, you see the ships and the, the buildings and the waterfront. This would be on the east side of that, called President. It was President Street. It's, that front part is still there. Uh, a little trivia alert here. Baltimore despite the Great Fire and 150 years of urban renewal, has three Civil War railroad stations still in existence. President Street Station, Camden Station, and where we are at Mount Clare, the Mount Clare Station is still part of our complex. So it's pretty unique considering all, all that could have happened to it. Now, <clears throat> what happens, and I, I'll have to talk you through this, the train comes in President Street Station. You see the, the train yard over there on the right receipt. And then the, uh, the tracks run down President Street and along the waterfront, that's the famous Inner Harbor there, and comes to Howard Street and then up to Camden Station. Camden Station was the corporate headquarters of the B&O Railroad and its biggest rail complex for, for active traffic in, in Baltimore. Now, Colonel Jones was from the north and he didn't understand anything about southern railroading. And one of the unique things about southern railroading was locomotives were not allowed to travel through a city. They stopped at those peripheral stations I showed you at the earlier slide. The cars are un unhooked one at a time and hooked the horses and pulled down the tracks through the city and then rehooked to power at the next station. Jones didn't know that. He thought he would either drive through town or they'd stop the train and they'd all get off and he'd march through in one mass and would be done with. Now, um, what happens is one car after another starts traveling <coughs> that track. Okay, and you have to understand the composition of Baltimore. Baltimore, the monumental city, and all that stuff. Well, back in these days, Baltimore was known as Mob Town. And the reason for that was, anyone see the movie Gangs of New York City? Well, that could have been filmed on Pratt Street. As a matter of fact, I think they used some of those characters. I mean, virtually some of those gang names, like the, the Pug Uglies and the American Rattlers and that. Uh, these guys, without Monday Night Football, street fighting was the next best thing, and that's what they like to do, especially during election time. So then you have, as I mentioned, uh, it's a southern s state with s slaves as well as, as uh, free blacks. As a matter of fact, we had the largest population of free blacks in the United States. We were half slave, half free. Uh, and then you had uh, pro-unionists. 
And then you just had spectators. I mean, let's face it, folks, if that car blew up out there, oh, that's mine, I'm parking that, uh, you'd all turn around and look, hey, there's something going on. So the street is filled with people. And they look up and they go, oh, look, there's soldiers in that car. Oh, look, there are northern soldiers in that car. They're from Massachusetts. They're abolitionists. Let's get them. And the violence escalates. Finally, the eighth car makes a turn on Pratt Street and it's disabled. They get it back on the track. By the time it gets to Howard Street, they've ripped out the tracks and they can't go any further. So the soldiers march to Camden Station. Now this shows you two horses pulling that. Now what happens is Captain Follins being 220 men, four companies are cut off and he's forced to march through that mob and they cut loose with you can this is very this is my my favorite rendition of that and you see the civilians you see the soldiers fighting back people throwing stuff and shooting out the windows by the time they get to the train station Camden station four soldiers are dead 36 wounded a dozen civilians are known to be killed and there's no way of knowing how many civilians were killed uh, were wounded this is the first land battle of the Civil War streets of Baltimore uh, the train goes on to Washington. Now, Lincoln is sitting there. Remember the geography, remember the maps. Maryland, are they gonna secede or not? Look what they just did to the, the one regiment that came through. And again, you have to walk in the steps of everybody. Let's look back at the state and city government. Probably just about every town in the world now has a plan, emergency reaction plan to a snowstorm, a tornado, a power outage. Nobody had a plan for civil war back in 1861. So the governor and the mayor and the city council meet that night, April 19th, and they go, what are we going to do? We don't want to leave the Union. We don't want to wage war on the South. Any more troops come through, it's going to be worse. So they come up with an idea. They're going to isolate Baltimore from the North, and they send militiamen and policemen north to the Bush River, the Gunpowder River, and they burn the railroad bridges, and they cut down the telegraphs. And uh, as uh, this shows them burning the, burning the bridge at the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. And as Mayor Brown said in his memoir after the war, uh, Baltimore entered a period of armed neutrality. Now, this begins on the night of April 19, 1861. The next day, they take this action. And all the militia units all over the state of Maryland pour into the city. And General Isaac Ridgeway Trimble, who uh, was a West Point graduate, was a railroad man, would lose a leg in Pickett's charge as a Confederate general. He's in charge of a 10,000 man, non uniform volunteer corps to defend the city. And the banks put up a half a million dollars, and half a million dollars back then is half a million dollars, to defend the city. So Baltimore goes into this shell, a defensive shell. And what is Lincoln going to do? If he takes too strong an action, because Maryland's teetering on the verge of secession, it hasn't gone either way. But whoever pushes first could push them into the other camp. Very, very delicate situation. And this is, like I said, the first, just the first days of the war. <coughs> Enter the first hero of the Civil War for the Union cause. Does anybody know who Benjamin Butler was? Okay, well, I usually get a lot of groans and laughs when I say that. He will not be mistaken for George Clooney. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin Butler was a political <coughs> general from Massachusetts, which means he had absolutely no military training, but he was a, he was a war Democrat that Lincoln needed. Uh, he is traveling one day behind the 6th Mass with another regiment, the 8th Massachusetts. And the reason that it's so startling that I call him the first hero of the war is Butler had absolutely no military uh, training and he was a terrible field general. He, got, he failed at everything he tried. After he leaves Baltimore, he will become the military governor of Louisiana. And when his headquarters are in New Orleans after it was captured. And the ladies down south were very rude to Union officers. That's probably putting it mildly, but they refused to interact socially and properly with the conquering Union officers. Well, Butler got fed up with this, so he issued a general order that stated any woman in New Orleans that insulted an Union Army officer would be arrested for prostitution. Now, during the Victorian period, that's a pretty strong move. They reacted. They were so impressed with Ben's uh, 
uh, administrative ability that they paint the, his likeness in the bottom of their chamber pots and thought of him every day. And that's not a joke. You can buy repros of those uh, chamber pots. His, so they called him Beast Butler. <coughs> the beast would arrest a lady. And then he had another nickname. It was called Spoons for all the silverware he liberated and took home with him from the plantations. So this is the guy that this guy, Dan Toomey from Baltimore, says is the first hero of the Union. Wow, it says a lot for the Union. Well, Ben had, this is his finest hour. Ben uh, arrives in Philadelphia, Wilmington, Baltimore Railroad, comes into Philadelphia uh, by, the, by the New Jersey Transit Railroad, and he meets General Patterson, who's in charge of the Department of Pennsylvania. And he says, look, trouble in Baltimore, you can't get through go down to the Susquehanna River, because there wasn't a railroad bridge there. Then it was a, they had a specially designed ferry boat called the Maryland, an iron ferry boat that could call, carry 20 rail cars at a time. It's probably the first one designed like that in the country, or the world maybe, by the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. Capture that boat, sail it down the Susquehanna River, Chesapeake Bay, and land at Annapolis at the Naval Academy, and march around Baltimore. So Ben does exactly what he's told. He gets down there, and uh, at the, the, so it's the 18th, so now it's the 19th, now it's the 20th. So he gets there, and on the morning of the 21st or so, uh, he's joined by a second boat, and that was the 7th New York. The 7th New York is one of the most famous military organizations of that state. And this is a print that was done, and it shows the 7th New York marching off to war on the 19th of April. They're marching down Broadway. And this is a throwback to the last Romantic War. When these guys went off to war, each soldier was given a red velvet camp stool and a bag lunch from Delmonico's as a going away present. So like I said, the, the, embers, the embers of Romantic War are there. They get to Philadelphia, they get the same news. You can't go through Baltimore. Well, efforts, you know, the 7th New York was a, was a high-class operation. He, had a, he must have had a Bank of America card or something. So he just charters a ship out of Philadelphia and sails down the Delaware River He's afraid that the Union ba Confederate batteries have lined the south bank of the Potomac, so he feels safer coming into Annapolis. So now we have two regiments at, at Annapolis, and they will work together. And uh, that remember that little black line I showed you, the Annapolis and Elk Ridge Railroad, about uh, 20 miles? The local um, militia, the pro-Southern people, had torn up the tracks, thrown them in the weeds and in the water, and disabled the thing. Ben... Um, working with the 6th Mass and the 8th uh, the Mass and the 7th New York, they, they go out and rebuild that. Now, you see a train in the background? This really falls into your, especially you guys can appreciate this with the steel business. Butler builds the first war train in military history. Now, he's going to rebuild this track, and uh, he's looking for, for rail service. He can't get any help from the president of the railroad. So he has his men break into a shed, and they find a disassembled locomotive. And, he, and Ben says, does anybody know anything about it? And Private Holmes stands forward and says, yes, sir, I worked at the factory that built it. I can put it back together again. He says, good, you're in charge. So they put the locomotive back together again. They take two cattle cars and saw off the top, make two flat cars. They load a six-pound howitzer on the front, troops, supplies. Private Holmes is the engineer, two passenger cars with infantry, and then two more flat cars with another cannon. First rail-mounted artillery in military history. Ben did that. And they come out of Annapolis, support cover fire for the troops, and they march to Annapolis <coughs> Junction. I realize you folks, you know, what's Annapolis Junction? Have you ever heard of Fort Meade? Have you ever heard of the headquarters of, of uh, National Security Agency? Annapolis Junction. It's where it meets the Washington branch. So the 7th New York march is there. They, they get on a train and they go to Washington. Now, uh, along the way, they had to rebuild a bridge. And then the 7th New York arrives at the Baltimore Terminal, b &O Terminal in Washington. Lincoln's elated for a number of reasons. He has some troops. He has a bypass, and he tells all the troops, stay out of Baltimore, come to Annapolis. And Ben Butler is the hero of the day. He's pulled this off. So they, they create the Department of Annapolis, put him in charge, and the Department of Annapolis is unique. He's in charge of all the territory for 20 miles either side of the railroad, and just keep the troops and the men going. Somehow the Red Velvet Line Camp stools never make it, but everything else does. And things are going along pretty good. So the first week of May, Ben gets in instructions. Now, Annapolis Junction is about halfway from Relay, where that famous bridge was, to Washington, D.C. 
So he's told to take some troops and some cannons and go north on the Washington branch and secure Relay, which is on the other side of that bridge. Because arguably for the first 90 days of the war, that's the most important railroad bridge in the world. Because that's the bridge you gotta go over to get to Washington. And you can't rebuild that baby overnight. So uh, Ben has two regiments and a battery of artillery and he fortifies the area and he secured the Washington branch. Well then, like I said, Ben is not a military genius, but he is a thinker. And he knows that his territory is 20 miles either side of the railroad. And it's been, now it's the first week of May, and Baltimore City has been in this period of armed neutrality, nothing in, nothing out. Nobody knows what to do because a false move will put Maryland in the Confederacy. Ben sends a telegram to John Ward Garrett, president of the B&O Railroad, and he says, I want a train. I want a big train with a locomotive at both ends. Train comes out, Ben loads a thousand men, a couple pieces of artillery, train goes west up the tracks towards Frederick. He wants everybody to know he's going to Frederick. He gets a blind spot on the tracks, he breaks the train in half. Half goes to Frederick. The other half comes rolling down past Relay and rolls right into Camden Station, Oriole Park at Camden Yards. It was a rainy day like yesterday. It's uh, getting dark. The Orioles had a road trip. They were taking two out of three from Boston. There was nobody there to see them get off the train. I usually get a laugh by that. I guess you guys don't have to laugh. <laughs> anyway, um, and he marches up on Federal Hill. Now, again, if you saw any of the beauty shots of Baltimore, you see the big green hill overlooking the Inner Harbor. That's Federal Hill. He plants his artillery there, and he sends a courier to Fort McHenry. And he says, I have occupied Federal Hill with my artillery. I'm attacked tonight, open fire on Monument Square with your mortars. Now, Monument Square is where the War of 1812, because we have the bicentennial of the War of 1812, so that's a big deal in Baltimore right now. That's the monument erected to the defenders of North Point and Fort McHenry during the War of 1812. It is the symbol of Baltimore City. It is the policeman's badge symbol. It is the flag of the city. It is the heart and social center uh, of Baltimore. So to aim cannon at that is really, you know, sticking your thumb in the eye of the Southerners, Southerners in Baltimore. Well, what's the outcome of this? Well, it ends the overt opposition to, to, uh, to the Union government in Maryland. It secures Maryland for the Union. Any Confederates, and there will be thousands of them, will have to leave in small numbers and cross the Potomac and form their units that way. And it opens up all the traffic. It ends the period of armed neutrality. So I would offer to you that Benjamin Butler is the first hero, hero of the Union, and through his unauthorized actions, transferred the opening battle lines of the Civil War from the Susquehanna River to the Potomac River. Now he's waiting for another big hand round of applause. Winfield Scott is flabbergasted. You did what? You didn't tell anybody? You didn't have orders? That thing had it backfired? So they promoted the Major General and send him off to uh, uh, Fortress Monroe where he can't do any more harm. But he has accomplished his, his mission. And this has secured the eastern end of the main line of the B&O Railroad. Again, if you think back to those maps I showed up, you've got Baltimore, you go up the line, you've got Harper's Ferry, and then you go up the line, you've got Grafton that's going to split. And what I'm doing right at this moment is I'm telling three stories at once. Of course, I can't talk that fast. So what I'm going to tell you next is happening simultaneously to what I just told you. Okay. When Virginia secedes from the Union, they immediately send militia troops to Harper's Ferry because they want to capture the arsenal there and the, the, the rifle-making equipment because what, what would the Confederacy need more than weapons and means to make them? So the Confederate troops take over and they appoint uh, Colonel Jackson at the time, who is, a, who is not the mighty Stonewall. He's the nutty professor from VMI who nobody can understand his actions, but he takes over and turns the the volunteers into a, a, a fairly good body of troops. Now, another map. So you see, we talked about Baltimore. Now, and you go up, you see Cumberland, and then we're going to go out of Maryland. That's where you got Grafton. But look here at Harper's Ferry. You see that dark line between Point of Rocks and Cherry Run? The B&O Railroad was double-tracked through that section. All railroads were not double-tracked everywhere at this point in time, whether north or south. So the uh, Norman Rockwell image of a conductor with his big gold watch wasn't just artwork, it was an absolute necessity. Trains had to run on schedule or they'd run into each other. 
but it was a real luxury to have double track. <clears throat> and the B&O at this time was tremendously involved in the coal business. Coming out of Western Maryland and what would be West Virginia, the coal came down and then it would go to the Washington Naval Yard, it would go to the factories in Baltimore. Some of it would be consumed by the B&O itself. Major income factor, major defense element. Well, Jackson is not a railroad man, but he understands the great need of railroad equipment and, for the South. To give you an idea of the disparity here, not one single locomotive was built in the Confederacy during the Civil War. The only way they got new equipment was to capture it, and capture it they will. So, uh, Jackson looks at the situation, and he sends President Garin a telegram, and he says, uh, um, oh, I need to explain something real quick. This first night, beginning of the war, from April 12th, the firing on Fort Sumter, until after, till the end of May, it's what I call the phony war. The phony war existed, and it'll explain how these things could be going on. Even though troops were marching through Baltimore, even though Confederate troops are at Harper's Ferry, even though Union Confederate troops are moving all around West Virginia, you could still mail a letter from Boston to, work, to Richmond. You could send a telegram from Baltimore to New Orleans. And if you wanted to, you could get on a train. If you were a young guy who wanted to join the Confederate Army, go down to Camden Station, buy a ticket, get on the train, get off at Harper's Ferry, and enlist. All, the reason why this was going on was, again, the delicacy of the moment. The Union wanted Maryland and they wanted the be and Railroad, but they had to be a little bit delicate or they'd push them into the Confederacy. Robert E. Lee gave explicit instructions to his field commanders not to harm the be and Railroad, not to be discourteous to Marylanders, because the South wanted Maryland and they definitely wanted the be and Railroad. So rail traffic is going day and night through Jackson's camps and they're, they're stopping them and making sure there aren't any Union soldiers on it, but other than that, things are going pretty much normal. Well, once Butler takes Baltimore, Jackson gets the idea that, you know what, Maryland's not going to leave the Union. So that's when he's going to take the action he takes. And he sends a telegram to President Garrett, and he says, look, he says, these coal trains all night long rattling, tremendous noise, my soldiers can't sleep. He says, you want to run your railroad through Harper's Ferry, you have to maintain daylight hours only. So President Garrett and and William Prescott Smith is, Smith is master of transportation. They put their heads together and they create a daylight only schedule where the trains are running through that bottleneck. A couple days go by and uh, Johnson, uh, Jackson sends another message. He says, look, he says, all this traffic is just, my troops can't train, they can't get across the tracks. You're gonna have to reduce your hours of operation from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm going to give you three hours a day to run all your trains through this double track. Well, what a logistical nightmare. What you would have to do is you'd have to line all your trains up at both ends and make sure this one got out before this one came because there's only a single track at either end. But they did it because Garrett wants to make a profit for the railroad and needs to supply the factories, needs to supply the Navy. And this goes on for two or three more days and then Jackson snaps the trap. He sends troops to either end and tells them, let the eastbound, up oh, stop the westbound. Up there, he says, let the westbound stop the eastbound. And within an hour's time, uh, he gives the order, okay, shut it down. They close both ends with all this rail traffic in there. They capture 56 locomotives and 300 rail cars in one hour without firing a shot. Now, Jackson begins to move these south. The problem is there's a small railroad from Harper's Ferry to Winchester, Virginia, it's called the Winchester and Potomac Railroad, very light gauge, very lightly built. So empty cars and small locomotives be taken down there. There is no railroad that runs north and south in the valley uh, from there to Strasburg and from Martinsburg to Strasburg. There's no north-south railroad. So he has all this equipment. He knows how valuable it is but he can't do anything with it. So he starts sending it down to Winchester and then they start moving it by, by the Valley Turnpike to Strasburg, put it back on the tracks and send it to the Confederacy. Well, this gets disrupted because an uh, over-enthusiastic officer burns the bridge about three miles east of Martinsburg where all these trains are parked. We're talking the equivalent of 25 trains 
being being captured in one hour, plus everything that was at Martinsburg, the rail roundhouse, the shops, everything. So now he's stuck. So he orders it burned and evacuates the area. Well, I won't bore you with the um, all the military operations, but what happens is finally the Union Army comes to life. Jackson uh, leaves Harper's Ferry and moves down towards Winchester, and then uh, General Patterson is a terrible general. He just abandons Martinsburg, so Jackson goes back to Martinsburg. Uh, what he had captured, as I mentioned, was um, 56 locomotives. Now this is called a Winans Camel. Ross Winans designed this style. It's called a camel because the, if you notice the, uh, the cab is over top the boiler and it only has four drive wheels. And the whole idea was that more weight over the drive wheels, the more traction. And these were big, strong locomotives for pulling trains over the mountains. Because don't forget the B&O has to go over the Allegheny. And they captured uh, what was called house cars at the time, box cars. Hundreds of box and lots of coal cars. These were specially designed coal cars built at Mount Clare shops to haul the coal that was necessary. So he's captured all these things. And then he, when he left, he burns, sends every, sets everything on fire. Well, you really can't burn a locomotive. So he, he blows the bridge at Harper's Ferry, and a little trivia there. The bridge at Harper's Ferry was destroyed and rebuilt nine times during the war. If you ever go to Harper's Ferry, you see those stone piers out there in the water? They date back to like uh, 20 years before the war. And uh, the, South, the South was always trying to blow up the piers, and they couldn't do it, but they always managed. And when they didn't blow up the bridge, the winter weathered would take it out. So it was quite a quite an ordeal, and that's that's the destruction there. Well, when when Jackson returns to Martinsburg, he sees all this wreckage. So that's the same locomotive you saw with all the woodwork burned off. But you really can't destroy a locomotive because it's iron, and it's very valuable to the South. So the South, realizing this, sends a number of, of a small group of people from the quartermaster department in Richmond, and the head of this is Captain Thomas Sharp. Sharp's a railroad expert. He has some other machinists and, and locomotive engineers. And what they do is they start disassembling the locomotives. They unhook it from the, from the uh, uh, tender. They take off the flue, the cab, the bell, the whistle, the, most of the wheels. They chalk it up under big wooden wheels. And then they hook it to teams of up to 40 horses. And they pull this 38 miles up the Shenandoah Valley on the Valley Turnpike up a dirt road. They move 14 locomotives and about uh, uh, 80 rail cars between Martinsburg and Strasburg because there's no way else to get to the Confederate Railroad. Then they put them back on the tracks and send them all through the Confederacy and they're used throughout the entire war. So that's one way the South got a lot of equipment. Just as a footnote to that story, after the war, President Garrett sent someone back through the Confederacy looking for this stuff because the, the, the B&O took tremendous hits and the government didn't, didn't reimburse them. We got back 12 and a half locomotives. 12 were all together. One we got boiler in different parts and things, so I call it a half. The 14th one, they had taken the boiler and mechanism out, put it in a gunboat down in North Carolina, and the gunboat sunk. So we didn't get the 14th one back. But, uh, but what this shows you is the attack on the B&O Railroad in near the middle of that main line, Harpers Ferry, a critical point, because Harpers Ferry controlled the traffic between Harpers Ferry and Cumberland. Nothing could, nothing could really happen between those points with the Confederate force there. Now, the third attack on the B&O, if you will, the third dimension of this, that's uh, Robert E. Lee at the beginning of the war, before he wore out. And you see the VA on his hat, because at the beginning of the war, at this time period, uh, the Conf Virginia had agreed to secede, but they were still the state, so it was the state military until they were officially became part of the Confederacy. Now, Lee, just as he had wanted Jackson to maintain control but not harm the B&O, so the two stories I just told you, we're going to go one more to that Y in the track, Grafton, and tell the same story again. This all happened at the same time. He says, he sends uh, Colonel Porterfield there to, to, to Grafton. And, uh, ah, I got a map there. So you see, see Grafton right there, and that's the split. You go up to Wheeling, or you go due west to Parkersburg, both on the Ohio River. And uh, 
he's, he doesn't understand the fact that the, the people in western part of the state, which will become the state of West Virginia, they're coal miners, they're railroaders, they're lumberers, they, they're not into slavery, they're, they're not into the politics of the Tidewater and the Shenandoah Valley, and they basically, in a, almost to the man, had voted against secession. Uh, and they've all, the problem was, to show you what the harshness is between the, I've learned all this just recently, it is kind of fascinating. The people in West Virginia were the red-headed stepchildren of the Richmond government. They got very little money for anything and they got unfair taxation. But the state legislature actually passed an ordinance that said if anyone discussed uh, creating a state of West Virginia, they'd be arrested for treason. So they, that's how they were treated. Well, so that's the situation. Lee doesn't quite understand. He thinks because he, if you recall the famous quote, Lee was offered command of the federal army at the beginning of the war, which would have really changed things. And he said, I am not an American, I'm a Virginian. And he went and took command of the Virginia Army. He thought everybody in West Virginia had the same philosophy. He sends Colonel Porterfield by train from Harper's Ferry to Grafton, uh, and he tells him he wants to organize five regiments and spread them out all over and protect Western Virginia from Northern aggression. Well, Porterfield gets off the train in Grafton, and he says to one of the B&O employees, where's the Confederate Army? He says, they're camped about two miles out at Fairmount, and if I were you, I'd get out of here because they don't really like rebels in this town. As a matter of fact, the only troops in town was one company of pro-Union militia. Well, Porterfield goes up the tracks, he finds the Confederate camp, and there's two or th like 500 men instead of 5,000, poorly equipped, and uh, he realizes he cannot create an army in Western Virginia, which, so he begins, he learns that that, that he can't, what he can't hold, he'll destroy. And of course, there again, originally he's told protect the B&O, then Butler takes Baltimore, all bets are off, okay, if you can't control it, kill it. So he starts burning bridges on the B&O. Well, McClellan, who we you know, all know was a regular army officer and uh, uh, had, re had left the army, was a railroad executive, he's made major general and he's in charge of the Department of Ohio. And he's got all these troops lined up on the other side of the Ohio River. The people from West Virginia go to him. And he had misunderstood. He figured all the Virginians were loyal. They go, no. I mean, loyal to the Confederacy. We're loyal to the federal government. We make our living uh, small farms, a railroad. You know, we're, we're first, second generation immigrants. We want to create the state of West Virginia. We want these guys out of here. So with that um, um, imitation, you might say, he immediately sends troops across the river and orders them to come down that, that Y from Parkersburg and Wheeling by train and have a pincer movement by rail <coughs> against Grafton and drive the Confederates out. This is B.F. Kelly. Kelly at the time, before the war, was an employee of the B&O Railroad. He was uh, colonel of the 1st Virginia U.S. Infantry, which will become the 1st West Virginia Infantry. And uh, he leads, and, and McClellan, this, this technology I talked about, McClellan tells both commanders, advance by train, rebuild the railroad as you go, restring the telegraph as you go, and keep me informed on an hourly or daily basis of your advance, and they drive the Confederates out. Uh, Porterfield understands that he's outnumbered, so he falls back, if you read, you call back, he's gonna fall back to see the little town of Philippi, he's gonna fall back to there, because from there, he's 20 miles from the railroad, he can still be a threat but he hopes to hold out. Well, um, whoops, got my fingers crossed there. McClellan, uh, or excuse me, uh, Kelly uh, realizes that that's not safe to leave him where he is and devise a two-prong attack to, to capture and drive the Confederates out of Philippi. And he does, and uh, this battle takes place, forgive me for not knowing this, but uh, it's uh, uh, June 3rd. June 3rd is the Battle of Philippi. Now this isn't a big battle, but sometimes it's where it is and what it is uh, that's important. This is a drawing. There's, there's General Kelly on his horse charging in on the left flank. Confederate artillery are bombarding the fort. They surprise the Confederates. They, they hightail it out. It's called Philippi Races is, is in, in the newspapers. And in, and in the scope of the battle, there was a total of 12 casualties and one Union soldier was killed and he shot himself accidentally. 
Kelly, who rode in the in, as the Confederates were leaving, was shot in the chest and nearly killed. He's the first Union Army officer of the war to be wounded in action. This is the first battlefield battle of the war and the first battle in Western Virginia. And it's the first Union victory. Now, what happens? We fast forward just a little bit. It's, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, June 3rd, July 21st, the first battle of Bull Run. Union is defeated. What are we gonna do? Well, what happened was when, when they won this battle, of course, Kelly's the one that engineered it, then they begin to chase the Confederates back towards the Shenandoah Valley, back over the Alleghenies. And they fight a series of battles, uh, Rich Mountain, Laurel Hill, and they're all Union victories. And McClellan comes across the river, takes personal charge, and again, innovation. He brings a telegraph with him. He has a telegraph operator in his headquarters at all times. And as he marches, he strings out the wire. And as he wins battles, he telegraphs his victories to Washington, to General Winfield Scott, and to the press. So he, he's, he knows what he's doing. So by the end of July, uh, the Confederate forces are completely pushed out of what will become the state of West Virginia. And Lee sends, um, uh, let's leave that one there. Oops. Lee personally comes into West Virginia and tries to save the situation, but he can't. As Lee's coming west, McClellan is ordered east and is given command of the Union Army and will create the Army of the Potomac. Lee's con he's considered the, the hero of the West. Lee, when he goes back home again, he goes home with three things. He goes home with a horse named Traveler, he goes home with a beard, and he goes home with a nickname Granny Lee because he couldn't do anything in Western Virginia. But what I offer to you, ladies and gentlemen, is, and this is all this on 90 days now, not 1862, 1863, Look at the actions that took place against the B&O Railroad, and as a result of those actions, Maryland stays in the Union, the Union gets the B&O Railroad, the, uh, the people in Western Virginia are free of oppression or, and are able to create the infrastructure that becomes the state of West Virginia on June 20th, 1863. So I offer to you that the B&O Railroad was the first political and military objective of the war. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Not at all. Well, okay then. Um, thank you for having me. I'll wander out to my table and if you think of any questions offline, we can discuss it then. Thank you. Um, hope, Thank you. Hope you'll enjoy your visit when you come to the, come to the museum. You're going to meet some of the people that I just talked about tonight in real life. Not real life, but they look real, I should say. <laughs> Wait, I meant, uh, I forgot that. Yeah, there uh, we have, uh, I believe it's eight lifelike mannequins, as I was telling the gentleman. We have eight lifelike mannequins in the exhibit. Seven of them have the right faces, and three of them even have the names. We have their, their stories. So you'll... You'll get to meet the people that were the B&O Railroad in 1861. Again, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, hopefully it'll help you get a few more people to come to visit us. Absolutely. There was a gentleman named Francis Beard who put together some real good books on Baltimore. Beard, I think his name was, Beard. Yeah. 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 Yeah.